within society we've got such fixed ideas about either being ill or being well and you can't be something in between. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and a host of your program. I am very excited about today's show to feature a special psychologist. Today's show is entitled An Embodied Understanding of Living with a Congenital Heart Defect. Dr. Lisa Morton is a counseling psychologist with a background in research. Lisa was born with congenital heart block and an atrial septal defect. She has had countless interventions, most notably starting with her first pacemaker at 11 days of age, open heart surgery to repair her ASD at age 12, and her 11th pacemaker in 2018. Lisa is passionate about improving care and the wider experience of living with a heart condition from birth. Lisa's current research interests include using a polyvagal lens to better understand the psychosocial impact of living with a heart condition, the impact of patient clothing on well-being and recovery, and using psychologically informed medical care to prevent medical trauma. Lisa works for the Somerville Foundation. She has presented a petition to the Scottish Parliament asking for national health care standards and improved care, which was issued in January 2019. She has published her work in research forums and psychoeducational materials and co-created the photography exhibition Scarred for Life with Two Friends. In the first segment, we'll meet Lisa and discover a little bit more about her heart condition. The second segment will involve us learning more about her decision to become a researcher specializing in the care of adults with congenital heart defects. And in the last segment, we'll discover more about the work that Lisa is doing with the Somerville Foundation. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Lisa. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. We're having an international show here because Lisa is from Scotland. Yeah. (laughs) And I guess that kind of made sense with your bio where we talked about you presenting to the Scottish Parliament. I think everyone probably got that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it sounds like you are a real pioneer, Lisa, being the first person in the world to have a pacemaker at the tender age of 11 days old. That's just remarkable. So it sounds like you've been witness to a great change in pacemakers over the decades, especially given the fact that you've had 11 of them. Tell us about how long a pacemaker has lasted for you and why you've needed so many over the years. As you've mentioned, I was fitted with my first pacemaker when I was just 11 days old. And in 1978, that was pioneering and a first at the time. And for me, that first system failed within 24 hours and I was rushed back to theatre. Oh, and wow. So until the age of seven, I'd actually had five epicardial pacemakers, each fitted by thoracotomy, so through the ribs, straight on the heart. And they were all set rate, so my heart rate was fixed. Mm-hmm. Um, which meant that it was physiologically limiting. Um, so there was no gym or exercise or active play. And then by the time I was 12, I was then given my first variable rate pacemaker. So it was slightly less invasive because that's intravenous. And I've had six of those, wow. three in the last seven years. I've only worn out a battery in a pacemaker once and all the rest have malfunctioned, usually due to lead failure. I guess that's because I was the youngest and... They've evolved and developed with me. And unfortunately, back in the day, they didn't have specialist equipment to take the leads back out again. So a lot of the hardware has been left in situ and and that can cause complications because each time I get a system in, they've got to try and create space. And there's a lot of kind of intravenous scarring and other complications that can arise. Like I said, over the last seven years, I've had three pacemakers and twice that's evolved extracting and replacing leads as well, which has been quite risky surgery and and quite complex surgery. Wow, that sounds so invasive. I mean, it's remarkable that you've had to endure so many pacemakers, and yet those devices have undoubtedly saved your life. Well, they have. I I just yeah, I wouldn't be here without them. Um, There's there's absolutely no doubt about that. But it's it's been tricky. (laughs) Did you start out with the pacemaker in your abdomen since you were so tiny? No, it was on the heart. So they went through the ribs and they fitted onto my heart. And like I said, by the age of seven, I'd had five of those systems. And all of the leads are actually still all on the heart because they couldn't take them off. They didn't have the equipment then. And now 
because it's been there so long, they wouldn't even try to remove it. Because it's covered with scar tissue, I'm sure. Yeah. When you said that it was on the heart, I'm visualizing the leads on the heart, which is not uncommon, but the entire pacemaker Mm -hmm. on the heart, I think that is rather uncommon, isn't it? I'm not sure. I just know that it's by thoracotomy and it was kind of put um, through the ribs because they had to break several ribs um, on the left. Sounds so painful. It was. It was really painful. Invasive. Yes, very invasive. Wow. Well, I've never heard of an 11-day-old baby having such an invasive procedure just for a pacemaker. But like we said, it's not just a pacemaker. It's what's keeping you alive and kept you alive as an infant. Did your mother know when you were born that something was wrong right away? She knew there was something wrong because there was no heartbeat. Um, But she could feel me moving. And these were in the days before you could do ultrasound scans. She felt me moving, so they obviously knew that I was alive. I was born healthy and pink, very quickly deteriorated mm-hmm. because I'd obviously been living by heart rate. So my heart rate plummeted. Um, I was moved to York Hill Hospital in Glasgow, and there, the at four days old, put me on an external pacemaker just to see what would happen because I was going to die anyway. Mm-hmm. By that stage, I was in congestive heart failure. Mm-hmm. And as soon as they put me on the external pacemaker, so that was through the groin, I became pink and seemed all right. They just thought, well, we might as well try this. So, like I said, it was a world first. They took me to theatre. It seemed to work, but then it quickly failed and I had an embolic stroke and I was paralysed on the left-hand side. And they took me back to theatre, they replaced the pacemaker and then, thankfully, I recovered to function. And it's really been a pretty tenuous journey since then. Yes. Like I said, although my life was saved and I was alive, um, I was limited in that the pacemaker was fixed at a set rate. And in addition to all of the surgeries I had, I was constantly in and out of the hospital because it was all so experimental. Sure. And a physicist used to come out from Glasgow University and he used to teach the cardiologists and electrophysiologists how to work the pacemaker. So I can remember there being a great big magnet in those days the, when they did the ECG, it was the rubber bands and the bits of metal that they put on you and wrapped it around you. Um, and I can just remember spending hours lying in a bed with a whole team of guys and white boats putting my heart rate up and down and counting holes in the ceiling. Wow. That is such an unusual childhood. I can't even yeah. imagine how, how m- that must have made you feel like a specimen, kind of, to have so many people just watching you. Mm-hmm. It does. Did you have to endure bullying at school, considering you couldn't take part in physical education? And it sounds like you had a number of physical limitations. I wouldn't say I was bullied. Um, I think congenital heart disease is quite unusual in that you can't see there's any disability. It's a hidden condition. And I think in some ways that's helpful. And in other ways, it's not because then you have to decide when and if you will tell people. Sure. Sure. There were some things as a child that I didn't get invited to. So I can remember not being invited to a party because the parents were too scared to have me there. I can remember even some family members being too scared to pick me up. Um, I can remember as a teenager, this boy asking me on a date and he wasn't from our school, so he didn't know. And then somebody else told him. So then I quickly just got ditched because somebody had told him I had half a heart, which wasn't even true. Oh, my goodness. So there were these kinds of experiences. I can remember another boy actually at school asked me on a date and I said no. So he then, almost in revenge, asked me in front of the entire class if my dad had to wind me up in the morning. (gasps) Oh my goodness. Wow. And I knew it was kind of in revenge, but at the same time I just thought, wow, that's really quite mean. I can also remember a different, a totally different guy saying to me that he couldn't believe I had a pacemaker or a heart condition because I was too pretty. Aww. I think, you know, that kind of stirred up my interest, I suppose, in psychology and trying to make sense of all of this, because Mm -hmm. I think that within society, we've got such fixed ideas about either being ill or being well, and you can't be something in between. But I did always have good friends. I think that part of it as well was that there wasn't really anybody for me to share my experience with. And I think that that's an important bit of obviously being human. And I would be in the hospital, I would have a major operation and then 
two or three weeks later, I would be back at school. Big part of it, like I said, was almost hiding it and pretending to be normal so that I fitted in. Sure. So I was having quite unusual experiences, difficult experiences that just weren't a part of normal childhood. But then going back to normal childhood, so that was quite confusing. And in those days, there was absolutely no psychological support. Right. And then I would say that I covered up my scars as a teenager. Did you? Probably more so, but definitely. On a daily basis, did you cover your scars? Or was that only something if you were wearing a special dress or going to the beach? Wearing a special dress or going to the beach, you you wouldn't see them if I was kind of in my school uniform or normal clothes. But I was quite conscious of them if um, I was wearing a dress going out of an evening. Texas Heart Institute were offering us a mechanical heart and he said, no, Dad, I've had enough. Give it to someone who's worthy. My father promised me a golden dress to twirl in. He held my hand and asked me where I wanted to go. Whatever strife or conflict that we experienced in our long career together was always healed by humor. Heart to Heart with Michael, please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Before the break, we were talking with Lisa about growing up with congenital heart defects and enduring implantation of pacemakers and open heart surgery. But now I'd like to talk with you, Lisa, about your decision to become a psychologist. We already touched on this a little bit in the first segment, but let's talk a little bit more about how you having to deal with all of those surgeries and the pacemakers and being under scrutiny with all of these doctors who were actually learning on you how to be an electrophysiologist, how that might have affected your decision to study psychology. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder myself when I was about 14 years old. At that time, I was chronically fatigued. But then when I was awake, I was hypervigilant. And I was having lots of flashbacks about hospital experiences, nightmares about surgery and being hospitalized. Um, I I got that diagnosis. There wasn't any help available. So I just had to learn to manage those symptoms in the same way that I had the the heart condition itself. Mm Mm-hmm. And I can also remember as a child looking around the ward and um, hospital visits and witnessing other children and their families suffering and there was just no psychological support or awareness. You know, I I can't criticise our teams at all. They went above and beyond the call of duty. Mm -hmm. They just, the knowledge wasn't there. Right, right. And I saw things that were happening that seemed needless that added to that. And I think Mm -hmm. that when you have that lived experience, you can observe that and realise what things add to that that you maybe wouldn't if you hadn't done. Mm-hmm. So I decided, I can remember deciding as a child that when I was old enough that I did want to become a psychologist and that I would be then use that training combined with my lived experience to help others coming through to improve things. Because I think it's hard enough living with a lifelong life-threatening condition, uh, receiving pioneering treatment without also having to struggle to make sense of the emotional and psychological impact. Absolutely. What you went through was so unusual, and it was so invasive. I just keep going back to thinking about them having to put those pacemakers on your heart repeatedly and leaving things in your body. That had to have some kind of effect. No wonder you had nightmares. It is surprising now that I'm kind of fully trained as a psychologist when I think about the medical trauma side of things yeah I think it's it's inevitable and I guess it's 
now having that understanding that those were abnormal experiences mm-hmm. and what I had was an, a normal emotional response to abnormal experiences that's not something I understood at the time sure because I was a child and right. I'd only lived that life right so I thought you know why am I having these feelings every other kid seems to be fine mm-hmm. I also struggled to understand my embodied experience because we were told in those days they thought their heart was just a pump and they said well your heart's working it's pumping blood around your body but I knew actually it might be but I still can't keep up with other children I still Mm. vomit when I try to run up a hill wow and so there was a discrepancy between what we were told I should be able to do and what I could do and again that's confusing well yeah absolutely now do you have any brothers or sisters I have one brother and he's fine so was that also kind of confusing how your brother was able to do things seemingly simply while for you even something like running up a hill was difficult? I think I knew on some level that it must be to do with my heart condition. And in those days, because the leads were quite fragile, I was told not really to do anything too strenuous in case the leads broke or became loose. So from that perspective, my expectation wasn't particularly there, but there were a lot of mixed messages that were given. On one hand, they were saying, well, don't do this and don't do that. But then on another hand, they were saying, you should be fine and you should <laughs> right. feel okay. Yeah. So it was, I think on reflection, they, did, they didn't know. They didn't know. And I think they didn't want to disable me. They didn't want to sure. stop me doing things. Right. But at the same time, they obviously were cautious and anxious about the situation themselves. Well, especially since within 24 hours, there were problems as an infant. Yeah. And it's not like you were running up a hill as an infant. <laughs> You know, you were just no. <laughs> a sick little baby <laughs> laying not. in the bed. So, yeah, it must yeah. have really scared them. And with you being the first, yeah. there was no precedent for them to be able to no. look at anyone else and figure no, out and what I, to do. And I found papers, um, research papers that they've written up. And I'm the youngest in the cohort. And there was a number of children that died. So mm. it was very tenuous for all of us. Sure. And we were kind of in it together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I was really intrigued by some of the research that I saw you're doing. Mm -hmm. Let's first talk about what the polyvagal theory is. That seems really interesting. It is. It's hugely fascinating to me because it's the first theory that I had read that I felt explained my lived experience and also the experience I've heard from so many other people living with a heart condition. So just briefly, polyvagal theory was developed by a neuroscientist, Professor Stephen Porges, who lives over in the States. And basically, it offers a way for us to understand how our bodies have evolved to deal with threat. So our bodies have these three modes, and we're constantly attuning ourselves to the environment and trying to figure out how safe we are and moving and flitting between these modes. And when I read about this, I wondered if the heart is central to the vagal system and Heart rate variability is a central component of how we move between these modes and how our bodies measure and judge where we should be and keep in that balance. Then it seems possible that if the heart is compromised due to a congenital heart problem or being artificially paced, or in fact, in my situation growing up, my heart was at a fixed rate, Mm -hmm. then that might impact on how we respond to threat. And if you combine that with other factors that can increase stress, such as being separated from parents, medical interventions, surgeries, and different aspects of potential medical trauma, then that offers us a more holistic understanding of why members of this population are at higher risk of anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder, which we know from the literature. It's something I I felt was missing. Yeah. I have read a lot about increased levels of anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress. And understandably, there are many secondary factors and reasons why that would be the case, because there are so many psychosocial stressors. Mm -hmm. But I felt that there was possibly more than that. There was maybe also a physiological reason that was being missed. And I think with that embodied framework, for me, that just made so much sense. And so I contacted Stephen Porges, and amazingly, he emailed me back right away. And I said, I've been reading about your theory. This is my experience. Um, My heart rate was set growing up. And I always had unexplained medical symptoms. And I also had been diagnosed with PTSD. And it seemed to flip between being very fatigued or being hypervigilant. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Did he think this could have a physiological origin? And he just emailed me right back and said, absolutely. And we got chatting about it. And then he invited me to contribute a book chapter to a book that he was writing. Because although Professor Porges, he's a neuroscientist and he's, he's done lots of amazing work, but a lot of the, the theory that he's done has now been picked up within the field of psychology and in application. And it's been used by a lot of body psychotherapists. So he was compiling a book with Deb Dana, who's a body psychotherapist in the state, and together they were putting together lots of applications of this theory. Amazingly, he invited me to write one on gentle heart disease and how the theory made sense in terms of that. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Lisa, before the break, we were talking about the research you've done, especially regarding the polyvagal theory. And that, to me, is just fascinating. I had never heard of this before I found out about you. And I saw a little YouTube video. A link to the YouTube video will be available on my website if any of you want to see it as well. They will give you a little bit more information. In this segment, I'd really like to talk to you about the work that you do with the Somerville Foundation. Okay. When did you first start working with this nonprofit organization? The Somerville Foundation is leading charity in the UK, and they support adults who were born with a heart condition. And I've been working as their Scottish campaign manager since I submitted a petition to the Scottish Parliament in 2012, following life-threatening incidents with my own care. Mm -hmm. Following that, I've sat on NHS Scotland's Scottish Congenital Cardiac Advisory Board. And finally, in January of 2018, Scottish healthcare standards for the first time were published. And they include recommendations for psychological support. So that was something that I was really quite obviously pleased about. And as I said, it's the first time we've had healthcare standards in Scotland. Wow. So I'm now working with Health Improvement Scotland to develop standards for local care. And we also have been invited to sit on the Scottish Obstetric Cardiology Network. There's an issue with maternal death and Mm. the highest maternal death is actually with mothers with heart conditions. So that's something I've been asked to sit on as well. So things are moving forward. And the role I have with the Somerville Foundation is very much advocacy and campaigning and trying to improve care. But I do also work with them to develop psychoeducational materials because that's something that I'm really keen to do is to empower patients um, and empower other people like myself with knowledge. So anything that I learn or publish academically, I'm also really keen to make sure that that knowledge is accessible to the people who will benefit most from it. I just think it's fascinating that you grew up with this condition that caused, would you consider the anxiety, depression, PTSD, would you consider that a comorbidity? I guess you could do, yeah. Or is comorbidity only physical problems? I don't know, but it's definitely additional conditions that you are having to deal Mm -hmm. with. And so you've been able to work through all of that to such a high level, Lisa, that you're able to turn your own trauma into a vehicle to help other people. That's really remarkable. I think that in many ways it was out of necessity and it's kept me sane. Yeah, And I think I probably went down that route to try and make sense of my own journey, but it also helps me create meaning from my own experiences and get something 
turn it into something positive. That's such a healthy response to be able to do something like that. It gets you outside of yourself and looking at yourself more objectively. I mean, you're still subjectively going to feel what you feel. You're still going to have the memories and the Mm -hmm. nightmares that you had. But I think that when you can give words to what it is that you're experiencing, it dispels some of the scariness, don't you? I think so. And I think possibly part of that journey that I've missed is in my training as a counselling psychologist, it's mandatory to have therapy. Mm -hmm. And I had therapy. And then I actually went on and had additional therapy with a body psychotherapist, Mm -hmm. because it's not safe to work with clients if you've not done your own stuff. And I found that incredibly beneficial. And I think if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be in the place I am now to be able to explore it from a kind of academic and objective standpoint. Now, by working with the Somerville Foundation, you must be coming into contact with lots of other people who also have similar experiences. Yes, we see that all the time. And Somerville Foundation has got a very active, closed Facebook group. It's a great place for peer support. And so many of the discussions and questions are around mental health. It's just such a huge issue. Oh, it is a huge issue. So one of the situations that I have seen happen here in the United States is that while we are now aware of the fact that, yes, psychological trauma does occur for a lot of people with congenital heart disease, we don't have enough Mm -hmm. trained specialists to help our heart warriors. Do you have any Mm -hmm. advice about that? I think... Part of the issue, and that's part of what frustrates me, we have the knowledge in psychology. Things have moved on significantly in terms of our understanding of things like polyvagal theory and body psychotherapy. A lot of the time it's about trying to push that through and finding the funding to do that because it is available. I'm also hugely passionate about promoting psychologically informed medical care. So I think that with that understanding and with the framework that I spoke about, There are many things that we could be doing to mitigate against the factors that can contribute to trauma and prevent that in the first place. So we don't have to wait until people become traumatized or have PTSD or it's got to that stage. I think there's so many things that we could be doing. For example, just a couple of weeks ago, I had an article published in the Journal of Health Psychology about using psychologically informed medical care to improve mental health and well-being for people living with a heart condition from birth. Medicine has moved so far in the last 50 years. We know now that 90% of babies that are born with a heart condition will live to adulthood. And then the 40s, only 20% did. And that's hugely significant and it's a success story of medicine. But what's happened is that people are depending on less humanised medical interventions for that survival. And it means that a lot of people are having experiences that are probably out with the normal human experience. And they can be scary and frightening and painful. And I think we really need to look at that and to think, how can we minimise any psychological impact? And I think there are so many different ways that we can do that and that we could improve care to that end. I think there's a lot of things that hospitals could be doing that could be changed to make us feel safer. Hospitals tend to be quite noisy with harsh lighting. And our sleep's often disturbed to take observations, mm-hmm. so blood pressure, etc. Mm-hmm. And often that's to suit the routine of medics rather than clinical need. And sleep is so important when you're recovering and you're not feeling well. Exactly. And then things like being asked to wear revealing hospital gowns can add to stress and feelings of disempowerment. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that's something I'm looking at at the moment with collaborators at the Strathclyde University. I also think compassionate communication from healthcare professionals and consistency of care are absolutely vital Mm -hmm. because how people communicate to us is such a big part of whether or not we feel safe within a relationship. It's so important to feel safe and I think for this population when so many of the treatments are pioneering and we don't really know and there's so much uncertainty Mm -hmm. anyway, Mm -hmm. then we really need to have safety where we can. Right. I know personally that many of the most traumatising experiences I've had have been when I've not been able to access the care I've needed. I think that the living with this condition brings so many uncertainties that we need certainty where we can have it. And we know that feeling uncertain can contribute to anxiety and trauma itself. And we know that there are studies that have shown that survival rates increase when 
doctors make eye contact and shake the patient's hand. So just the simplest things, if they were integral parts of training mm-hmm. for medics, I would like to see that. And just thinking about a hospital environment from a healing and trauma-informed perspective would make such a difference. And being in the company of a soothing presence is one of the best ways to enhance feelings of safety. So I think it's incredibly important to have a loved one by your side oh, yeah. for children, but also adults. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also important any therapeutic interventions include an understanding of that background so that they include a focus on safety and stabilisation. And there are also techniques that we can learn to help us feel safer in our bodies, such as meditation, breathing and relaxation exercises, safety and coping statements. And you can find a lot more about them. I've got a research blog on my website and also links to publications that I've written. A final thing I would say is I think that in terms of feeling safe, social inclusion is really important. Mm -hmm. And so improving wider awareness and understanding, because like I mentioned before, this is a hidden condition that can create difficulties in terms of employment, um, schooling, understanding with peers. And so as such, that was one of the reasons um, that I co-created Scarred for Life on behalf of the Somerville Foundation with two friends who also happened to be born with a heart condition, Caroline Wilson and Jenny Kumar. And we created that photography exhibition um, of portraits of adults with congenital heart disease to try and help change perceptions about scars. And it also told the story of each adult on the back so that people could start to understand both the kind of heterogeneity and all of the different stories. And it was launched at Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum in 2015, where it stayed for a month. And we've since toured around various venues, including the Scottish Parliament. And it was really well received by the public and had national media attention here in Scotland. And since then, the Somerville Foundation have replicated it across the UK. Wow, that's so empowering. Yeah, and it was so nice to read. This has just been an amazing program. I am so thankful. Thank you so much, Lisa, for all that you're doing and, gosh, for sharing this research everywhere that you can. Well, thank you so much for giving me a platform. I don't see any point in doing any of this if it's not reaching people that can benefit from it. Exactly. Wow. Absolutely. Well, we will definitely put (laughs) a link to your blog on my website. I hope you'll come back so we can talk about the different kinds of techniques we can use in and outside the hospital to make our children and our adults feel safer. But for now, Mm -hmm. I have to say goodbye. So thanks again, Lisa. Okay, thank you. That does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Find us on iHeartRadio and subscribe. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.